Welcome, everyone, to another edition of Frame Rate. Uh, we hope you're all doing well. I know we're, uh, you know, still most of us listening to this are in some degree of quarantine or lockdown or, you know, life being changed very drastically. And uh, we are thinking of all of you. And uh, we're really excited to come back here to talk about a film that we all have very strong feelings about. This was one that before we knew Frame Rate was going to be Frame Rate, we knew we wanted to have some kind of an outlet to talk about movies that weren't necessarily the movies that we always talk about. And in that conversation, I was like, there will be blood. We have to talk about it. There will be blood. And both of these guys were like, no, that movie sucked. No, I'm kidding. You both love it. But Jamie especially was, he was like, this movie's been one of my favorites, you know, as, as well. Um, Dan was very intrigued by it. We're like, okay, let's let's do this. And then we kind of got frame rate going, which initially was more of kind of a genre thing, right? And now we're kind of opening it up to talking about non-science fiction and other kinds of films. And a film that I think is a great one to talk about is Paul Thomas Anderson's There Will Be Blood from 2007, which uh, was released alongside No Country for Old Men. Uh, they were distributed by the same companies. There were a lot of similarities in terms of setting. They're very tonally audacious films from great American directors at basically the zenith of their powers coming out within months of each other. And basically the award shows stood no chance that year because these two films just destroyed everything. Um, before we get into the film and our personal feelings about it, just uh, I think that this is a movie that if you haven't seen it, you owe it to yourself because it's a historical document uh, on par with like the great works of art of the 21st century. I truly think, and there's a reason, I, I mean, I, this is also substantiated by other people who are smarter and more educated than I am on this stuff. I mean, it's, it, it's, I'm sure it holds a record for the inclusion on top 40 lists of the decade for the 2000s, 2010. This is a movie that basically every single film critic writing in the mid to late 2000s agreed this this was one of the cultural documents of our time. This was a cinemagraphic masterpiece and we are here to talk about it tonight and uh, I want to go ahead and kick it off first to Jamie. What are your overarching thoughts on this and what's your history with the film? Well, I have to begin with Paul Thomas Anderson because I was following his work way before There Will Be Blood. Um, my first immersion into his world was Magnolia, um, which is almost a three hour opus, um, which was, I believe, 2004 or might have been 99. Uh, very early, like late 20, late. It's 99. It's also it on our frame rate list. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so that film really was an explosion for his career. It was an all star cast. Uh, the story, it was layered. It was, it, it was like a, if you could put, make a, a movement, uh, a musical movement into a movie, it would be. Magnolia. So I was still in film school at the time. So I was going nuts over it. All of my other classmates were going nuts over it. And so we all got into the church of Paul Thomas Anderson and there we resided. And then, um, he was not a prolific filmmaker. Um, so there will be blood came a couple years later, three or four years later, I believe. Um, and you know, he's 2000 years later. Is it eight years later? Okay. Yeah. I yeah. think there was a film, in between them, actually. The punch Drunk Love. Yes. Um, so he was not prolific. And so every film he would release, I would see. Punch Drunk Love, you know, I saw that. I thought it was fantastic. Um, so when There Will Be Blood was coming out, I I saw the trailer and I knew, like, this film was going to be amazing. I just knew it. I could just tell from the trailers because the trailers really reflected the film, the tone of the film. And I, I, I think I saw the... Th the film alone uh like twice and it was an experience i'll never forget i left the theater feeling like this was the rebirth of american cinema it reminded me of 2001 in some ways in terms of how quiet it was the score um how deliberate and intentional each shot was how we were getting to know these characters visually as opposed to talk 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 and that's something that American cinema is not known for. We're known for explosions and exposition and more explosions and expositions. Paul Thomas Anderson continued to throw that on its head in terms of who he was as a filmmaker and his style. And then, of course, you have Daniel Day-Lewis, who has done no wrong, um, starring in the film. And Paul Dano's one of his first big roles. It put him on the map, essentially. I believe he was nominated for Best Supporting Actor. Uh Either it was a Golden Globe and it was an Academy Award or it was one or the other, but he was nominated for that role. So I was, I was, as you guys know, I love cerebral filmmaking. I love films like that we've discussed before, Annihilation. I mean, I could go on and on and on. And 
There Will Be Blood was the culmination. I feel a sneeze coming on. There will be a sneeze. I'm okay. Sorry, I really feel a sneeze coming on. Um, this is so w- intense. I know. I know. Like I feel. I'm just right waiting now. for the sneeze. The sneeze <laughs> is going to blow people away right now. It's Holy like shit. warmer and it's windy, so my allergies are up. Um, oh, they're coming. Let me go back a little bit. There will be blood for me was the culmination of everything I loved about cinema, especially being fresh out of film school, loving Kurosawa early Kubrick loving the slow burn. And that's what there will be blood is. It's a slow burn. It is a film for, for lovers of film and not, it's not a mass media film whatsoever. It's, or a mass audience film. Like it's just not a film that's people are going to say, I mean, I know people who went in the film and like, Oh yeah, Jim J. Lewis. They sat down. I remember hearing walking out of the theater. What was that? I remember being just sort of laughing, like, not like, Oh, Oh, I got it. Like, I'm so proud of myself, but I really understood this was not for them. This was for people like me, people who go to cinema for something deeper, something more meaningful. So it blew me out of the water. I, I, it's one of the best films I've ever seen. And I, I just saw it again recently because I knew we were going to talk about it. And I'll tell you the ending, um, which we'll get to eventually. It. I don't know if the ending worked for me this time. Um, not that it didn't work, but I was just like, oh, it's interesting. But I also noticed other things as I've been thinking about the ending, like, okay, this sort of makes some sense. Um, so that's my quick overview of my experience with the film. And uh, again, even with some issues I might have with the ending, it is a masterpiece of a film. There is no filmmaker like Paul Thomas Anderson, and there will never be one again. I think he is the, I think, Someone like Martin Scorsese has done some great films and some not so great films. I cannot say that about Paul Thomas Anderson. Every film he has made has been incredible. Um, He is not hit or miss. He is all hit. And I think part of that comes from just really knowing what he's doing, really taking his time. Every project he loves, not to say that Martin Scorsese is different than that, but there's just this big difference there. So I'll get into more later. So, but that's my first few thoughts. Nice. Dan, what about you? Um, well, first of all, I would say that uh, the first time I saw this was probably only four or five years ago. And I was just, you know, I'm still a beginner to like sort of studying film and getting deeper into it. And, you know, this podcast project that we've been doing and uh, Shoulder of Ryan, you know, I've been on the show for a couple of years now. So I've gotten more serious about film in the last couple of years. But, you know, before that, five years ago, I'd like, uh, except for the really big ones, I wasn't really paying attention to like who a director was. And I think while I still appreciated depth in film, um, I wasn't quite on you guys' level in terms of what I was looking for in a film experience, maybe. Um, Or certainly all those things have increased for me now. Um, So I don't remember my exactly my first impression of the film. I I was going to say, Jamie mentioned Daniel Day-Lewis and sort of like the crowd. And I was like, you know, when I think, because I've seen, so I've not seen a lot of Paul Thomas Anderson films. In fact, I'm going to, like, I've never seen Magnolia. (gasps) Here we go. Um, So I'm kind of on a mission to go back and uh, revisit those. But um, Daniel Day-Lewis has done a lot of films that are like not crowd pleasers. Like he's always exceptional in his performance. So everybody knows he's like this, the most extreme version of a method actor that could possibly ever exist. I mean, he was doing, uh, I think it was, uh, what's the, the play with the skull in Shakespeare. Is that Hamlet? The crucible. That's Hamlet. Right. So, oh, oh. Um, <laughs> Shakespeare. I just heard the, the skull. <laughs> he was great in that too, though. Yes, he, he was with Winona Ryder. I read he was in a production of Hamlet where in that scene, he literally thought he saw his father's ghost and he ran off stage and like left the production. I mean, he's kind of a crazy artist in that way. So obviously his performances come out and just blow everyone out of the water because you're like, holy crap. But you know, it's like, okay, I can think of like Lincoln maybe as a film that he was in that was a little bit more like popular with the masses, but it's still like a historical epic. It's super long. I haven't seen the Phantom Thread, his last film, uh, which is also PTA, right? I, I really do want to see that. Um so yeah, anyways. Um, Last of the so Mohicans yeah. was blockbuster. He was the star. It was a blockbuster film. It made shit tons of money. That's true. That is probably his most accessible film, I would say, in terms of in terms of that. I mean, that was Michael oh, yeah. Mann. 
who has a. I'd say it's 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 between it's probably between Last of the Mohicans and My Left Foot. I think those are (laughs) his two. two Gangs of New York is probably the other one. Oh, Gangs Uh, of New York is that that actually was a big deal for him, which I actually really don't like that movie. That would be an interesting one to talk about because most people love it. I did not enjoy it. Speaking of of Scorsese, right? But anyways, um, yeah. So I can only give you my impressions uh, or my brief impressions off of this last time i think i watched it last week or something and um yeah i think being prompted a little bit by comments like patrick and jimmy had made to me before um first of all the sound design of the music which i'm sure patrick is going to go off about uh super interesting and weird and like you know they made all these choices where you're like wow i would have never expected someone to make this choice and especially like jamie mentioned 2001 that beginning kind of hum sound that gets louder and it's just so it builds so much tension there's so much tension building constantly in this film um so i was impressed by that the cinematography is just spectacular i mean the color palettes like everything just looks perfect and beautiful it looks like a painting um the effects i mean these burning oil wells all that stuff is just incredible looking um yeah costume design so yeah i mean i I, there's really a lot to love in this film although it i think requires multiple viewings to really get to kind of get deeper into the characters and understand the themes that are going on um so yeah i think i understood a lot more this time around and uh i did really enjoy it it's it's dark it's i don't find it like a fun film but i it's beautiful and interesting and definitely a masterpiece so those are my initial thoughts patrick that's great. Um, so, so it's funny you mentioned multiple viewings because this is one of the first movies I can remember. Maybe it's because by this point in my life, I had like enough income to be able to go as many times to movies as I actually wanted to. But I like could not stop seeing this movie in theaters. I went alone. I went with different friends. I went with like the girl I was dating at the time. I just went with like everybody that I could convince to go to the movies with me because I was fucking addicted to this when it came out. So similar, similarly to Jamie, um, my PTA obsession really started with Magnolia, which came out when I was 14. And I saw it when I was 14. And I just, I, it, it, for whatever reason, it like touched a, a really deep artistic chord in me, which is funny because it's a movie that like seems on its face to be kind of not really speaking to younger people because so much of it is about mortality and so much of it is about, you know, biblical illusion and these things that like, you know, I think most teenagers probably aren't necessarily looking for. But I think some of us, you know, were, and I know I was at the time without realizing it. I was just so blown away by that film that I went in this big PTA kick, went back to Heart Eight, fell in love with Boogie Nights, all these other movies that he had. Um, and uh, and I just, he's one of those filmmakers who, for me, represents absolutely everything that cinema is capable of doing. And a lot of the time, that's humor, too. It's really easy in PTA's output to focus so much on the gravitas and the high themes and the headiness of it. But it's also, a lot of the time, really funny. There are moments in There Will Be Blood that are absolutely hilarious, right? They're so dark and they're couched within, like, a fucking, you know, such obscure darkness that you kind of have to be okay with laughing at it. But if you are, you get a sense of his real worldview. Um, I, so I wanted to sort of like, you know, bookmark that. The other thing is that, um, like Dan was alluding to the score for me, this is like, this is one of my absolute favorite film scores of all time. I think if, this is the first time I had ever heard Johnny Greenwood scoring a film before. And I know Dan and I are both huge Radiohead fans. I mean, for me, like, like the, the idea that Paul Thomas Anderson was teaming up with Radiohead was like, that was, I mean, I like, I still remember reading about that happening and I couldn't, I felt like I was hallucinating. It was such a cool idea. You know? But he's done it a lot, right? He's, he's done well, a lot he of their. Does. Yeah. He did the master. He did an amazing collaboration with Johnny Greenwood in 2000. And actually in other members of radio had like Nigel Godrich, their producer, um, and a bunch of Indian musicians that came out uh, a few years ago. That was absolutely incredible, which we can talk about later. But my point being that like Johnny Greenwood was not a film scorer at that point. He had done, I think one project. He was, he was, you know, very reticent to take this on. He was the BBC's composer in residence at the time, I think. He was branching, because, you know, in addition to his guitar playing, he's a violist and he's a, you know, a composer, obviously. So he was kind of branching more into, quote unquote, serious composition. He had this piece called Popcorn Superhead Revolver that was played that was uh, very much in the style of Christoph Penderecki, which is just these big cluster tones and, and things. And, and PTA heard it and he heard this uh, previous film score that Greenwood had done. And he was like, I want you to score this movie, which on the face of it is like not the kind of movie aesthetically that I would go to the Radiohead guitarist to score, right? It's like a period historical piece that is very long. It's very uh, kind of like rural. It's very, it, it predates the electric guitar. It's got all these things in it that seem like they wouldn't really work with Greenwood, but 
because Paul Thomas Anderson is so brilliant, he saw something within what Greenwood was expressing with his music that he wanted to have brought to the film. And I think that the marriage of music and sound, sorry, of sound and visuals in There Will Be Blood is like right up there with Blade Runner. I really feel like it is one of those films that is just inextricably linked. You cannot hear the music without seeing the visuals and you can't see the visuals without hearing the music. I think there's no better you know, example of that than the first 25 minutes of the film, of course, which have no dialogue in it, right? And the first time you're sitting in the theater and you're hearing this incredible blaring orchestral soundtrack that is just so disjunct from the visuals that you're watching because you're watching these like big vistas of you know expansive deserts and things and people prospecting and you're hearing this like contemporary orchestral music that's just booming the theater and and you you kind of release yourself to that vision if you're up for it and the second you do that the second you can reconcile these two different aesthetics in your mind you are fucking locked and loaded for the rest of the movie because the movie is all about that the movie is all about contradiction and disjunctedness right the movie is all about the marriage of capitalism and religion. It's the marriage of lies and truth. It's the marriage of family and, and personal you know, goals. It's all of these different things that I feel like are always in conflict. And you're introduced to that in the first 25 minutes of the film. And I just uh, do just want to say that like when we discussed doing this episode, I said, this is my favorite non-science fiction film. And it, it truly, I mean... And I, I love many of his, of his movies. Like I think the ma- I, I think we disagree on the master actually. If I remember, I think we had a little bit of an argument about that a while ago. I, Maybe not. That's another one I just don't understand. I'm gonna have to watch it again. Yeah, I remember this came up. I, the master I absolutely fucking adore. But but even in the context of that and and some of, and Magnolia and some of his other films that I'm obsessed with, There Will Be Blood is I think the the best thing that American cinema has produced in the last twenty years. And I feel like uh, seeing it in theaters over and over and over again was one of those real constitutional experiences for me as a young film-going person. And going alone and riding my bike to the theater and just sitting there in awe of what I was watching on the screen, which was just like the most transportative, immersive filmmaking that I had, had really ever seen in a theater in my entire life. But... Anyway, the film, like I said, opens with this extended sequence with no dialogue in it. Uh, and I'm curious for you guys, if you want to you can go in whatever order you want. The first time you saw that, what were you thinking, if you can remember? Well, I wasn't really thinking anything. I was just, it's one of those things as someone who went to school for film and has made them, I just remember feeling like I'm home. This is why I go to the theater. I felt the similarly, I felt similarly when I watched the Lighthouse, to be honest with you, there's a there's a textural similarity between these films where you're just immersed in um, the sights and the sounds of this this world. And that's a very tough thing to do as a filmmaker to really immerse people in um, uh, a world that you're trying to create. Um, and I think. For a lot of people, they're like, oh, why aren't they talking? Why aren't they talking for me? Like, I don't need you to t-. a real story, not a real story, but I think, you know, um, I can't remember. I think it was Alfred Hitchcock said, don't show and tell, either show or tell. You have to choose between what you're going to do. And you can show the story or you can tell the story, but don't do both at the same time. And Paul Thomas Anderson really was able to show the story, show what was unfolding. And I know we're going to get into this in a little while, but the character of um, Plainview, Daniel Plainview, I... I loved him. I loved him. I thought he was fantastic. I rooted for him and despised him at the same time. I thought he was great. But also in reference to Paul Thomas Anderson as a filmmaker, his films are not easy to watch. They just are not. They're not. None of his films are like, oh, let's just watch one of his films. They're not. They demand you to really engage and they demand several viewings. It took me three times to watch The Master all the way through. Not because I was bored. Not because I was like, where's this going? But because it was a lot to process. It's hard. It's emotionally taxing. The Phantom Thread was really amazing. But by the end of it, I was wiped out, you know. Um, and There Will Be Blood is different. I was really felt satisfied the entire time. Seeing that kind of color. Seeing the 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 story. But also, sort of like what Jerry Goldsmith did with Alien... You don't know if it's soundtrack or if it's sounds from the world that's being created. Some of it is, some of it isn't. What is it? Whether it's the well exploding or the fires raging, um, and then it'll dissolve into score, and you can't quite tell when that begins and it ends. I love that. I live for it. I live for it. Um, 
So, yeah, again, I, I don't remember my first viewing. Um, so I can only speak to the last time I saw the film, but, um, I guess revisiting it, I was sort of paying attention to Plainview's character, knowing what he becomes at the end and like knowing the whole story and kind of just watching him as a younger man and thinking about the transition and trying to, you know, it's so atmospheric and so slow. It really does allow you to put yourself in the character's shoes, which is what I did. I wasn't, I don't think I was observing. I think at least briefly, I tried to put myself in his shoes, which is a very uncomfortable place to be because again, he's a very dark and uh, scary character in a lot of ways. Um, And so, yeah, just kind of watching, I was, I was trying to see, sort of I mean I was absorbing the the music and all of that I wasn't like thinking too much but looking back on it I guess I was trying to see if there was like a switch in the character that happened like kind of was he always the way he was from birth or is it something about the hardships he endured when he was a young younger prospector and what he was going through that kind of made him sort of dislike people and write off humanity in a way and mostly focus on, you know, becoming rich and being successful. So I was kind of watching for that and and watching how the film kind of portrays that or displays that. Um, that's that, that, that's what it was on the, in the back of my mind while I was watching the beginning. It's funny because, because I, I remember so distinctly the first time I saw the film uh, because I was just beaming from ear to ear for that first 25 minutes. I could not, my face, I remember my face hurt because I couldn't stop smiling because I was like, I, I, for one thing, I was just so blown away by what a beautiful choice that was and what like a wonderfully respectful choice that was to just show us this thing and throw us into it and allow us to just envelop ourselves in it for such a long time. It's really like, it's hard now because we've seen the movie so many times to forget how long that is. But in the moment, it really, when you're sitting in the theater and the lights come up and you're kind of waiting to kind of like get a sense of what's going on, you know, and usually sometimes it'll start visually and you'll have five minutes or you'll have like Prometheus, you know, seven or eight minutes of visuals. Right. And that even then it's, it's notable. Like this is the, this is the beginning of the film and it's an event and it's quiet and there will be blood. Like there's a huge stretch of the film before you know anybody's name, before you know like what time it is really. And I just, I just loved, I loved, loved, loved that choice so much. And I just luxuriated in it and I still do. And it also, I think part of why I love that so much as an artistic choice, other than giving you a chance to be unprejudiced about Daniel Plainview, who you're very, who's very clearly been through hardship and is struggling and is also somehow avaricious in spite of all of the, you know, the humbleness of, you know, cause, cause he's, you know, breaking his leg, but he's thrilled about discovering, you know, or right. Like you're getting to kind of figure all these things out for yourself about him as you're watching it. But in the absence of dialogue, you're hearing this music very clearly and you're seeing these visuals very clearly and there's really nothing to distract you from that. And so you're basically just totally immersed in this world for a really long time so it starts to feel like home. And I think uh, a, a major reason why it feels so real, because to me, like the, histor- the, the attention to detail, like Jamie, you're talking about Robert Eggers. Similarly, the production detail and the costuming and the world design and the building of it, like to me, this is like one of the best example examples of it ever. Every single detail feels so accurate and so lived in and so real and dirty and like gross and perfect, you know? Um, and you really get to like spend time luxuriating in that when it starts in silence like that. Um, but yeah, we, we don't have to go, you know, in order through the whole movie, but I, I guess something that I, I want to kind of touch on because I know we're already kind of running lo- a little bit lower on time that Dan mentioned is the character of Daniel Plainview, who of course is the protagonist, I guess, of this film, although I wouldn't really call him that, but he's the central character that we follow, right? Um, in a lot of ways, he reminds, I, I'm, I'm sure, you know, uh, reminds many people of a certain character that inhabited Xanadu. Uh, the film has a really, you know, similar arc to Citizen Kane, obviously. Um, but I think that Daniel Plainview is a uniquely American character who says some things that are really not bad about the values that made America what it was and what maybe in some ways it still is, right? But at the heart of that is this real dark void that for three quarters of the film is kind of obscured a lot of the time. And most of the time you can swear it by, oh, he's trying to like, you know, make a business deal. So that's why he's carrying HW around everywhere, or he's trying to get on somebody's good side. That's why he's being kind of charming you know, or like maybe he really does want a brother and that's why he's, you know, treating this guy like he's, you know, 
coming into the family business, etc. And there are these glimmers going on. And this is why I think Daniel Day-Lewis is just such an astounding actor, is that even when he's acting outwardly in one way that's very clear, inwardly he's acting in a different way. And those things are, to me, the entire movie always, like even at the end when he's gone nuts, you still sort of feel for him. You still sort of feel this pain that he's living through, this unexplained void that he's trapped in. And I, I, I can't stop talking about the movie because I love it so much. I'm going to shut up. I do want to toss it off to you guys. What do you think about the character of Daniel Plainview just in general? Like, what are your impressions of him? What do you think he's fighting for or running from? What do you think about Daniel Plainview? Um, well, I think there's very obviously some undisclosed trauma in his past, first of all. Um, I think, again, his general demeanor and distrust and kind of hatred of people in general, um, I think indicates that he was probably raised in a pretty tough conditions and a pretty tough family. And we don't know that background. Um, and in terms of sort of the duality of the struggle, which I do see sometimes, like I, I, I do see him as kind of a shitty person overall, but you know, he's certainly not unilateral and he's not simple. Um, and so I think the two things where you see this struggle between good and evil or between right and wrong are family and God. I, that's what I see um, as themes. Um, like you said, HW and then um, his supposed brother that comes back because he seems to be driven, especially with the brother, he seems to be driven by a sense of loyalty that is not necessarily something he wants to do, especially with the brother. It's just like, okay, this guy's my brother. I kind of have to take him in. I have to let him into the business. I have to show him how this works. Like, it seems like something that I don't think he would have chosen to do, but he feel, I, I feel a sense of duty in him. Um, whereas I do see love certainly in certain scenes, especially when HW is younger. And so there's a little bit, there's some affection there as well as a sense of duty and, you know, taking care of this child, et cetera. Um, which I'll leave it there because I know that you guys will have comments on it. Um, and then I think very obviously sort of the religious scenes. Um, I mean, the moment where he's forced to like confess his sins and in, in, in the front of the church with Paul Dano, you know, like, uh, you know, put, put, you know, slapping him and like that whole scene is so intense and the stuff he's making him yell at. And it's like very much a, God, I wish I was a more articulate, but <laughs> it's it's just very much you can see that there's this personal struggle and I think distaste for God and religion that he has that it's very obvious in his face. I mean, he wants to kill everybody in that room. You know what I mean? Like he's super humiliated and that's the last thing he ever wants to do. But again, the goal here is being successful and making money. So he's like, whatever, like, let's get this over with so that I can, you know, move on with my life. Um, and I think that's a very, very important moment in the film. And it's almost, I think the, you, you only see, well, so I think towards the end, uh, both in when uh, HW comes back to him and tells him he wants to start his own company and he kind of disowns him. Um, and in the scene at the end in the bowling alley, um, I think that those are moments of him being 100% in charge and completely powerful and just being like, no one's going to make me do shit that I don't want to do now. Like, and he's but he's very like lonely and alone you can see that you know like there's all this context to what's going on especially the scene with hw where he's in this big house and it's just like super dark and he obviously lives there by himself and it looks super lonely but he's relishing in this like power to like tell hw to fuck off you know what i mean which i it, so it's i can't relate to those sentiments but i can see them and i can see that struggle within him at the beginning and in the middle of the film um and he seems to just kind of give in to his darker themes uh in terms of drinking and in terms of how he treats people uh in the in the third act but um, i'd love to hear uh what you guys think about that just a quick a quick co not correction but but a quick clarification he's not he doesn't do the baptism scene to move on with his life remember why he does it 
Yeah, I couldn't remember the exact detail, but I know it's a deal. I know he's going to get. Yeah, something. he just wants to be able to build a pipeline through Bandy's right. farm. Bandy's farm has been this impediment the entire movie right. to him. This one little tiny plot of land that he just needs to get rights to to build. A oh, pipeline, right, right. And Bandy makes and him so go back to church. Bandy with him. knows that he killed his, you know, supposed brother, and that's why. And he basically holds it over his head, saying, like, you know, like if you if you go and get cleaned, you know, I will give you the rights to this. So it's so that's why, like, there's this. I mean, that's why the, the pathos of that moment is so profound because you can tell he means it, of course. That's why that acting moment is so astounding is because in the midst of mocking everything, he's, his eyes actually mean what he's screaming, right? Which is incredible. But, like, he means it. He only gets to the point where he allows himself to acknowledge that he means it because it's capitalism and because he wants the rights to build a fucking pipeline. And that is the ultimate fuck you and his opinion on, you know, religion and on the people who are holding him back. He's able to say, like, you know, I will, I will lie for you if I can, you know, get a business deal out of it. But in lying for them, he actually admits something for the first time in his whole fucking life, right? He actually sees the reality of his situation for that one instant when he screams he's abandoned his boy. When he, when he screams it, he sees for one moment the reality of what he's actually doing in his life. And then it's gone again, right? Within, within five seconds, his eyes, you know, tighten up and he starts laughing again and then he's all done and he gets the rights to, to do the pipeline and then through, of course, you know, side drilling, he ends up draining all the land anyway, and he gets to fuck Eli in the end. That I, that sequence, I think, is just uh, incredible. You know, Jamie, what about you? Well, number one, I don't think he means he means his confession whatsoever. He plays the game, he plays it well, he knows how to do it, and uh, yeah. So I don't think he ever means it. I think he's humiliated. And so you see the anger that he's having to go through it. But in the end, he walks off the stage, mission accomplished. He's good. I do. I don't think he's ever alone. I don't think he's ever lonely. I think uh, Daniel Plainview is essentially walking capitalism. And what does capitalism do? It bulldozes over everything in its sight, un, unfettered. That's just what it does. And I think that's who Daniel is. And I, but the same time, I don't, he has a lot of men that worked for him and there's scenes where he's interacting with those men and he's kind to them and he's trying to be fair with them and he care, cares about them. And I think for, for a long time with his son, his adopted son, he, he cares about him, he loves him. And then, but the, there's a switch there when he realizes his, his son who is deaf can no longer be of use to him. The, the switch flips. And so he starts like, oh, I don't know now. His love changes for whatever reason. But I think up until that point, I mean, he runs in there and saves his boy. And he holds him in his arms and he sort of lays on the floor with him for a while. He loves that child. He really, truly does. And I think that there's a lot of love in Daniel Plainview. But I think what's lo the louder voice in him is I need to make money. And I, need, I want to make a lot of it. And the film begins essentially with the gushing of oil and it ends with the gushing of blood. And I think that's that's really what America, I mean, this whole country was built off the back of death and destruction of whether it's the African American race or the the Native American race. I mean, that's it's just true. Or the or the slavery or the I mean I, that's really or just, what or just immigrant labor, yeah. Like you Yeah, know, like, immigrant labor always I on mean, the backs of poor people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's always on the backs of poor people. And I think there will be blood is not so much a, a story about how this country was built in terms of immigrant labor, slave labor, all of those things. It's more of a story about capitalism and what power can do and what money can do. And I think Daniel Plainview began with, you know, he's down in that well. He's looking, he's looking, he's looking. This is just him. It's just him. That's it. And then it gets a little bit bigger. And then he finds this child or this child ends up being uh, an orphan and he adopts him. And I think, I don't think Daniel is lonely. I think that there are ties. You could tell when they're talking about his sister, when his supposed brother is talking about his sister, that there is connection there, that there is love there. He, when he says his sister, you know, his head goes up like, like, oh, my sister, you know, where is she? How is she? Or whatever that conversation was. And then he felt ultimately betrayed. I think the death of that man wasn't because Daniel Day-Lewis hated him. It was because Daniel Day Lewis or Daniel Plainview was betrayed by him, and that was a forgivable sin, unforgivable sin. But largely, I I don't 
I think his character is complex. I don't think he's all bad. I don't think he's all good. Um, and I think that's sort of the story of America, to be honest with you. Yeah, I agree. That's well said. I think it's interesting because his outward actions and if, if he were in like any other movie would place him as like just clearly the villain. Like he's just the antagonist to the story because he does all these things that are, I mean, literally murder for one thing, but also like he has just no qualms about lying to people or stealing from people or fucking people over or being, you know, outwardly evil. But because the performance is so complex, we're empathizing with him throughout and kind of hating ourselves for it and then trying to figure out why we feel that way. And it just plays a game, I think, with the viewer the, the entire time. And I think Daniel Day-Lewis's performance is so mercurial and so interesting, partly because he's able to get multiple layers out of these things that should be so simple. And it makes you realize, like Jamie, you were saying, that like the history of America is really not simple. And that's something, obviously, we know and it's something that we talk about, but it's not the way that it's been taught, you know, for a very long time, right? Like we are taught that we came over, you know, and like negotiated deals with Native Americans, right? That like we we ended up, you know, like giving them things in exchange for crops and we traded wampum and we got an island and we built it. And then like all these poor Africans came and we, and we took them and, you know, and, and they were the backs of the labor and then we emancipated them because we're fucking heroes, you know, all these. But the reality of America is nothing like that. The reality of America is, is, this, is the history of raping people to get access to land. The, the history of America is extraordinarily dark. Great things have come from it and great things have happened in that. And the overall arc of democracy is an incredible experiment that obviously is, is you know, one of the great crowning achievements of our species. But it's happened because of extraordinarily evil things. And what I think is amazing about this film, and also about, from what I've heard about Oil by Upton Sinclair also, is that it really gets into that. It really gets into how dark and dangerous this stuff was. I, I want to say something um, uh, in commentary to what you guys are saying. So <clears throat> Daniel Plainview, although we don't know his past and we don't know where he came from, I think seems kind of like he was, if not an immigrant, some kind of a lower sort of like caste person in society, I think. Part of that's because when you see him when he's silver mining in the beginning, you know, he's wearing like what looks like actual underwear and he's just sort of like out there in the desert, you know, alone under terrible working conditions, just desperately trying to get this. It's like he just kind of left home and went to, you know, try to find a new life and fell into hardships, but also in the interactions that he has with other rich people, right? Even after he becomes a rich person, like he does not feel comfortable around Standard Oil. He does not feel comfortable around the people who hold the keys to the kingdom. He does not feel comfortable around other people who have pipelines. He feels like an outcast. And indeed, when he gets the trappings of, of you know, wealth, when he gets this ridiculous mansion in the end, when he gets his Xanadu, he's more alone and more isolated and more, I think, um, alienated than ever before and i think he's more keenly aware of it and he's burying himself in his drinking to kind of get away from that but i think at the end of the day he's one of these people who was sort of born alone into the world not fitting in anywhere he found what made him feel like he was fitting in and he went so aggressively in that direction that he basically tried to outrun his own self and, and i feel like when he says you know it's finished when he says i'm finished at the end of the movie it's it's just an extraordinary moment of of release it's like the pressure valve on the oil derrick going off it's like you know, like what, where else can this go? Right? Like it was a self-fulfilling prophecy, his birth to his death. Um, before we wrap, I, I thought maybe, you know, if, if you guys are up for it, we can just kind of talk about a couple of our favorite sequences in the film. If you guys have any that we haven't touched on yet, um, things that really stick out. Um, and I want to give a special shout out to Kieran Hines, who I think is just one of the, I think he's just like one of the best actors alive. Everything I ever see him in, I'm like so fucking pumped. And the fact that he got to be in this movie with Daniel Day-Lewis was just so wonderful. I think he's just an amazing actor. And his character in this movie is the heart of Daniel Day-Lewis's character for a lot of it, right? He's he's like the sort of human side of what Daniel Plainview was doing, um, which, of course, doesn't serve him very well in the long run. But um, uh, I, I guess for me, like a sequence that I think is just extraordinary is the sequence that culminates in H.W. getting injured. I really feel like, Jamie, you kind of already touched on this, but that moment of real love and caring as Plainview was running towards him and, and protecting him. Uh, you know, it's obviously like when I saw this, I didn't have kids yet, but now that I do have kids, I can really, um, I can I can see depths in that scene that I didn't even see before. But even before, I felt that scene was extraordinarily powerful because it's so antithetical to him, right? In some way, even though he's a, he is using this child for business deals, he's treating him kind of well right in general he's single parenting this and you know hw is is like you know surviving on this frontier lifestyle more or less okay and feeling more or less you know at least observed 
Um, which, which, you know, I, I doubt that Daniel Plainview had a good male role model in his life to teach him how to raise a kid. So like that moment to me is like the, is the culmination of that journey. It's like the last chance of redemption that he had kind of explodes when that Derek goes off. And then after that, you know, his son can't hear anymore. And it becomes this, this thing that just accelerates until HW burns the house down. And I think that moment of sound and fury and music and noise and, uh, and cinematography is just just incredible when you see that burning Derek going up, and you see against that beautiful thirty five millimeter film the dark, dark, dark oil and the bright, bright, bright fire and the men running in terror who are out of focus because they're so far away. They're at, way at the edge of the frame, and you see this activity going on. And as Daniel Plainview is realizing the implications of what this means as a business proposition, but also like the human implications of his son being there, it's this crazy urgent moment in, in cinema history that I think is just one of the most astounding things to behold that I've, I've really seen in a movie. Yeah, I, I agree. I think we talked about the beginning. Uh, that scene's incredible. Um, I think the end in the uh, bowling alley is like just super powerful. And the dialogue is so well written and the conversation between um between Daniel Day Lewis and Paul Dano is just so you know it's I think they're Paul Dano's got these assumptions that he's coming into the conversation with about what kind of power he holds and that's when you know slowly um Plainview kind of lets him know that he has no power um and just the way they wrote that and the, the whole i drink your milkshake line that's just such a great line you know and the way i mean the way daniel day lewis delivers it is just incredible that whole scene and then the fear you know that that uh, dano acts out just that's a superb scene drainage yeah so good i would also say that same scene patrick that you talked about um when the Derek goes up in flames and just them everyone staring at it and the light the fire and it's not destruction, it's it's different. Even though the thing is burning down, what's also happening is he's becoming infinitely rich. He has now, like, and everyone's looking on because lives are about to change. There is so much oil in this field that our lives will never be the same. And people are looking on in disbelief. It's a very interesting scene because... I think on its face, it looks like, oh, wow, that's terrible. It was destroyed. Oh, no, nothing was destroyed there. Nothing at all. So that's a really great scene that I love. I would also say at the end when, um, again, when Daniel Plainview is forcing Paul Dano's character, Eli Sunday, to say who he is. He's a snake oil salesman. He's a liar. He's what that mantra that he makes him repeat over and louder. And, of course, it's a, a mirror of what... Daniel Day Lewis's character had to repeat in that church. He's humiliating. Right, he's and I right loved there, right? to see, I preferred seeing Paul Dano's character humiliated more than Daniel Day Lewis. I felt like at least Daniel Day Lewis was being honest. The whole time he's being honest of who he is. He's not, he's not pulling the wool over anybody's eyes. Now, yes, does he have a son there to be that like doe eyed sweet child? Yes. His mother's gone. Sure. As a little bit of a lie there, but generally he doesn't lie about who he is. He is who he is, and everybody knows it. And you see it on display in that saloon or restaurant when the other oil guys come in. He is who he is, and I love it. And even though there's a lot to not like about it, Paul Dano's character is just this snake crawling around the grass trying to make money, trying to make deals, trying to get money, trying to build up. And to me, when you do that with religion, it's probably the worse than if you're doing it with business. Because at least with business, people sort of expect businesses to be a little bit cutthroat and not to say that it should be. Um, but that dynamic there, when the, when the tables are turned at the end, that's, I just, I'm so satisfied watching him be humiliated. Right. With, Me with, too. Uh, go ahead, Dan. Yeah. Uh, just a small point, but I was going to agree. Uh, yeah. With business, whether you do it in a good way or in a bad way, like there's more or less ethical ways to do it. But the goal is to make money and make as much money as you can for the stockholders and for everybody else. Whereas in organized religion in that way, it's like, well, the 
the stated goal here is to save people's souls, right? So everything else that happens that's not directly related to that is is inherently sneaky and um, something that I think we distrust, especially those of us, like most of us have, who you know, have grown up with organized religion and kind of seen the downsides of it, et cetera, et cetera. Totally. And I was just going to say, I, I think that the the end of the movie plays triumphantly a little bit and it's and it's crazy like the the flavor of the triumph is unlike anything else in any movie ever because you, because i agree that it feels like a uh like like a victory in a way as dark as it is like it, it feels like the right side of this argument won but like you're also like sort of rooting for this like incredibly volatile murdering character who just beat somebody to death with a bowling pin which also like why the fuck would Daniel Plainview have a bowling alley in his mansion? I just love that. I love how like excessive and ridiculous Cause he can. You can. Picture him, right. Can you picture him actually bowling in it for, it's just, it's just ridiculous, but it's like he had all this money and he had to never use it. And he was like, well, I guess I might as well just do this now. That's what I've earned. You know? Um, and I also love when HW comes back and the lead up to that and how sad that that is. I think it's just extraordinary. And I love that actor who plays the adult HW. Um, I also think that it's interesting the Paul Sunday Eli Sunday argument. It's a little it reminds me a little bit of the totem in Inception that we just touched on a few weeks ago, right? Where that's something that I mean, it's not quite as stark because it's you know there will be blood isn't set up as some sort of like a mind game puzzle to unlock, but it's very weird how Paul Sunday just completely just disappears from everything and there's no <laughs> it's just never explained, and his twin brother uh, is just transformed by his you know early interactions with Daniel Plainview. Um, and I, do you guys have any thoughts on that before we close? To me, that's always been one of those really interesting moments in this movie that make it more abstract than on the face of things it appears to be. Well, I was going to throw in some background trivia related to that. Um, while Daniel Day Lewis had like a year to prepare for this role, um, Paul Dano was only supposed to play Paul Sunday initially. And then they had a different actor playing Eli Sunday. And then I forget what happened or if he got fired or whatever, but basically he had a week to get ready to play Eli Sunday. And considering how, you know, deep and intense and complex that role is pretty amazing. What Paul Dano did with that role, you know, having so much less time than Daniel Day Lewis to prepare for it. I don't think I've ever even processed. I think I watched that scene. Like, I don't really know what's going on here. I don't, I didn't really realize that it was a brother. I don't think I ever understood that. It was never laid out. Like, I just thought, I don't know what I thought, but oh, I, my, my first viewing, <laughs> I thought it was like, it was like his alter ego. Like I thought they were the same person, but he was for whatever, uh, scheme yeah. that he was doing. He was, he was doing those parts, I guess. Another interesting scene though, what that I think is great, um, and terrifying is when Eli Sunday crawls over the dinner table to choke his father. His like father, st- yeah. You stupid man. Like, he is an embodiment of Daniel Plainview. He's just, it's all under wraps. It's all quiet. He's just parading around as if he's this great holy man. I also love, too, when he's humiliated, when he's like, oh, you introduced me, and I'll walk up. And he doesn't do it. And he lets all the people walk up. And I love that scene. I love to see religious people being being humiliated. I just do. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I think it's an unresolved question about Paul and Eli. I, I think b- because of the way that it was ultimately played by the same actor and the way that it was written and the way it was edited, I, I think it's incredibly nebulous what actually happens there. Mm-hmm. And that, again, gets me back to the same reason why we love talking about the Blade Runner films so much is it's it's just one of these sort of unclosed loops, right? And you can look at it however you want to look at it. And sometimes you don't even realize you're not looking at it until like, I mean, I didn't think about that until probably four times of seeing the movie. And then I was like, wait, what the hell happened to the first brother, right? Like, where, where did he go? Um, and it's just, you don't know. But he's not in any scenes with Eli at the same time, right? He's not at that dinner table when Eli's choking he's his father. Not at, he's not at the church, yeah. He's not at the church. He's just gone, right? It, yeah, it's almost like one of those Christopher Nolan type things where you're like, is he the same person? Is he not the same person? But, you know, exactly. if, if you read about the film, it lays out pretty clearly that they're brothers. But again, the way the way they But play he never it, shows up again. Right. It's like, right? They're never in the same room at the same time. <laughs> right. And so I think subconsciously when we see that happen, and, and I, I, I'm not going, I was about to say whether it's intentional or not, but it is, this is Paul Thomas Anderson. This was an intentional choice. That simple 
swap that happens there where one character just sort of vanishes into the ether of this other character who is so transfigured all of a sudden like that that is very intentional and that is supposed to throw you in a weird direction i want to just briefly um say that like you know paul thomas anderson obviously has had an incredible career a, a movie that he did that i feel like landed with kind of a thud that i think is brilliant is inherent vice and part of why i think that's a brilliant movie is because it captures the aesthetic of thomas pynchon the novelist who i adore who reminds me a lot who wrote the book and reminds me a lot aesthetically of paul thomas anderson and so for anybody who really digs pta check out some of pynchon's novels because you will find a, a real kindred spirit in that they do the same thing like this eli uh, sunday moment where events will happen and they will just not be explained and you will be kind of left for a while kind of tumbling around trying to reconcile what you just read about and then the movie the movie or the novel is sort of proceeding from where it was and you just sort of go along with it and eventually you realize that the more loops open up the more interesting the story becomes and the more interesting the story becomes the more you abandon yourself to it and the more you abandon yourself to somebody like pta the better hands you will be in because the choices that he makes are so well informed and so well considered and so brilliant that to watch it for what it is is really the goal and i think a lot of the time people complain about his films because they can be long and they can feel kind of meandering and they can feel kind of bizarre and they don't really adhere to a lot of the sort of traditional hollywood tropes and they don't really have the you know normal arc i mean magnolia in, in itself is like one of the most structurally complicated films i've ever seen in my life and all of his movies are like that to some degree. Even Boogie Nights, which on the face of it is sort of a crowd-pleasing movie, that has a very bizarre structure to it. It's not just the sort of rise and fall. There's a lot of very strange detours that it takes along the way, right? And so I think, like, if you if you watch PTA's films like they're a postmodern novel, if you kind of allow yourself to embrace the idea that they should be kind of quixotic and they should be kind of hard to follow, and you look at a film even like Boogie Nights, which on its face is sort of like a typical kind of downfall of a hero story arc, even that's all over the place and very complicated and has a lot of detours. And I think if you watch his films like the way that he intends you to, which is as something that is deliberately different, is deliberately kind of difficult that you have to wade through, I think you'll really appreciate it for what it is. And what it is, ultimately, is complex, just like the human experience. And I think that, that one of the great gifts that, that Paul Thomas Anderson brings to cinema is uh, filmmaking that feels like a real human experience. And there will be blood from beginning to end is something that, to me, feels like, like a real life unfolding in all of its warts and all of its complexities. I say that's a great place to end it. So thank you for listening, everybody. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks again to all our patrons for supporting uh, the shows, and we hope you guys are hanging in there with uh, the quarantine. Hopefully, this will be over soon. But we're going to continue to bring uh, do this remotely the way we normally do, and bring you guys as much content as we possibly can. Thanks again for listening. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>